I said, what do you mean? This is Van Gogh. And she said, forget the machine, the publicity machine that's behind this. This is one of their best painters. That's what brings the tourists in. That's why we're here. But that's not a good painting. And all the stuff he did with after he cut off his hair, it's terrible, she said. This is awful. But we have an emotional attachment to it because we identify with the struggles he had. This painting here, this other one, this is the work of genius. Because he was sane. He knew what he was doing. His technique was flawless. So <clears throat> I said, but what about this one? And then she started to dissect it. Well, look, look at the struggle he's had with the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> look, he hasn't got the composition right over there. And see how <clears throat> the paints are mixed here and he's a trouble trying. So <clears throat> that was a great lesson in aesthetics. And we're not taught aesthetics in secondary schools, unfortunately. Which is why we see young couples in the BEQ. Uh, <laughs> Shells, somebody's anticipating what's going on. And the BQ cells, you know, and they've got the, they've got the uh, swatch out of the chart and they're trying to match a paint colour for the carpets, not understanding that a paint hue will look different on different materials. Uh, so I would have aesthetics taught in children's schools, infant schools, you know, when infants are sponges. Uh, I wouldn't teach them about sexuality because it's so bloody complicated. <laughs> um, I met an uh, OS oh, it's truly <laughs> over complicated. Um, I met a priest once who said uh, if only uh, sexuality was as simple as the worm that lives in the sea when it wants to procreate it simply divides into two. <laughs> <clears throat> and I used that for a script, a detective for, where the detective is a complicated character himself and doesn't realize how much of a misogynist he is. And he starts to hanker over the widow of his dead brother and crosses his own moral line. And so the script is essentially, I don't write university thesis, I write scripts, and I write essays. Um, but it's essentially a study of male aggression of women, all the way from the disloyal husband through the tough businessman, you know, who uses women, uh, to the pimp of the iron bar, they see. And I showed that script outline to the American producer. Gareth! How can you write this stuff? What kind of life do you lead? <laughs> Is it pardon? This stuff in the s and brothel. Man, it's really horrendous. And I said, it's called creative writing. I've never been in a brothel in my life. <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, you just you learn to be perceptive about human nature. And I'm perceptive. Human nature. First thing my wife noticed, she said, My eyes could show seven different emotions in 10 seconds. That was the first thing I attracted her. I said, Well, it wasn't in my money. I was a penniless writer at the time. She's become, I was well known as a filmmaker, producer, and theme director, but in time she became much more famous. And I ended up walking behind her like the Duke of Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, the bruises of Mark Hill married to uh, a highly driven, internationally famous, successful painter. There's nothing to stop them when they want to paint something. So, uh, from very early days, when I won, when we came top in primary school and won a book uh, because of my uh, intellectual ability, <laughs> um, and they took me out of primary school early, um, put me into secondary school, Portobello secondary, but they put me into an article class. <laughs> they totally disintegrated. I had a stepfather who didn't really understand about anybody who was creative, especially a guy like me who likes poetry. So <clears throat> one day 
uh, a quick anecdote. One day, uh, walking down the street, and there was a very pretty young blonde girl with a very handsome pretty blonde woman walking towards me. And as I started to maneuver myself to let them pass, they maneuvered themselves to stop me getting past. Till eventually they were right in my face. I said, well, I'm sorry. And this, the elder woman said, I know who you are. I said, pardon? You're Gareth. I said, well, I'm sorry for being introduced to that. She said, no, you won't remember me. I'm your primary teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I was about 35, but you, got, you have to try and imagine me with long dark hair, right? And, and before it was fashionable, dark designer stubble. You know, I hated scraping my skin with a sharp bit of metal. And I remember some children asking me if I knew I looked like Jesus. Uh, no, it's true. Sir, do you know you look like Jesus? Uh, I'm assuming the, the children recognize me from his portraits. But uh, and I now look like uh, the children's shroud. So, uh, anyway, they, uh, the women started to talk. And she said, I remember you always tried to get a seat at the front of the class gap. Did I? Yes. So you could look at my legs. <laughs> <laughs> and you know she was right. It was one of these moments of revelation where the first feelings of sexuality you know, start to happen. So in my book, there are there's a chapter on that. There's a chapter on the professor's perversion. Uh, this was when I met um, and made friends with an eminent university psychiatrist. And he stole one of my wife's paintings. And of course, me being half Sicilian, it didn't take long for me to do my mafia number. And I said, look, I'm not asking you again. I will refer this to the police if you don't hand it back. It was a 6,000 pound painting. She had loaned him. Uh, so that he could, according to him, have a tapestry made from it. Um, so anyway, I ended up telling the police, called on them, and uh, a young policeman and a female police officer arrived, and it took about time. Are you sure you want to do this, really? Because it's quite an elderly gentleman, and I mean, his university uh, status. I said, yeah, he's 77, but he's still a thief. Yeah. And I said, I, um, I did uh, some background, as I tend to do. I did lots of background and lots of bloggers before we even got near the sites, including wings. But that's another story. And I said, I discovered that he's got a form. <laughs> what kind of form, says the male police officer. I said, well, <clears throat> in London, he was caught stealing ladies' underwear from liberties, <laughs> which is the kind of thing psychiatrists tend to have. You know, they've got their own problems. <laughs> and that, that's how they reach an understanding of your nature. <laughs> and uh, when he was out in front of the judge, the beak in London, the judge said, are you not the eminent psychiatrist who wrote the stride book, The Discipline of the Mind? I am. I guess, sir, I am, Your Honour, he said, hoping for a lenient find. Have you not thought of taking your own advice, said the judge. And, of course, fined him £3,000. So when the two police officers went to his door, they came back and told me I would get the painting back. I said, uh, what happened? <coughs> well, we knocked on his door, waited, and we saw him kick him from behind a curtain. And then we noticed them climbing out of a back window <laughs> and running off down the street. And uh, I said, it's 27 years. What did you do? Oh, nothing, said the woman, the female police officer. We just sat down and had a fag and wait until they ran out of puff. <laughs> <laughs> so the books that I would like you to buy, I've got some of the first, the first one here. Um, are uh, full of S's that you've never seen before, okay? And I hope you can identify with. But I, I am a typical 
Michael Scott, who um, had to leave his own country to find work. And it was, no matter what you think about the glamour romanticism of Los Angeles, it was a pretty horrible experience a lot of the time, except my son lover. Um, and when I heard that in 2014 we were going to have our referendum, I knew that I had to come back. Um, but being slightly disingenuous, uh, don't, don't misinterpret my enthusiasm uh, for naivety, I'm quite shrewd. But I can make horrible errors of judgment. And the misjudgment I made was I joined the SAP. And I asked myself, why am I doing this? Because I've promoted the SAP for years. I've brought them onto arts committees. Uh, I've uh, uh, written and directed part of little broadcasts. I brought in Sean Connery, did wide vision shots, used helicopters. Um, it just, you know, the SAP just seemed to me to be the normal, natural platform to re regain, reinstate our liberty. Uh, Gareth, our time is limited. Okay. Uh, if we, if we, can, we would like to get a, do a little bit of Q&A for, okay. for a few more minutes, but if you can... Uh, okay. You don't mean with me. If, 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 if people want to ask you questions, you're really welcome. Okay. Well, I'll, okay, I'll round up right now. I can feel the heat building into the <laughs> A quick anecdote to finish off with. Uh, my cousin, Ian Christie, was a journalist, and in the first collection of books I've written about his experience, he went off to South Africa for the Times and Reuters. Um, young lad from a working class dis district in Edinburgh, uh, but a first class journalist. And he ended up following the liberation leader of uh, Mozambique, Samura Michel and writing about him and sending back reports. Michel, started, Michel was a, a democratic socialist, invited to lunch with the Bayer Queen. Yeah, he had that kind of experience. Uh, but eventually, uh, my cousin discovered that his reports were getting blocked. And then one day, he opened the newspaper, The Times, to find himself called the Lord Ho Ho of Mozambique. This was a big shock to him. He discovered that the British press were pay, playing a double game. And he told me uh, a story how he had followed Samir Michel around the various villages. Michel would give a tremendous oration, and the people would, in the village would uh, put their hands up like this, as we occasionally do, and say, Viva! Freely more, meaning freedom for our country. Uh, we would say it three times, Viva, freely more, Viva, freely more. And he said, he pointed to Ian, he said, This Englishman has come all the way from Great Britain to tell the world of our struggle against the Portuguese. And afterwards, Ian said, That was a wonderful speech. But please, he said, uh, I'm not English, I'm Scots. Uh, and Samir said, well, I know that. How can I tell my people that? You've not heard of people like you, you've heard of the English. It is very important to me, Samira, please, I'm Scots. Next village, big oration, Viva Frelimo from the villagers. And he turned to Ian and he said, this Scotsman from London <laughs> has come to tell the world of our struggle for our liberty. After which he said, please, Samira, you have to get this right. I'm certainly not from London, I'm from Scotland. I know that, says, uh, said uh, Samira, but how can I tell my people that? They've not actually heard of your little country. Please, Samira, it's important to me. So, Next village, the final village, big oration speech, and he said, uh, and this Scotsman has come all the way from this country, a country called Scotland, who fought and won its liberty from the English. <laughs> and afterwards, Ian said, for God's 
sakes, I'm gonna, please, we fought and we lost. I know that, I said to God. How the hell can I tell my people that? Please buy my book. Sorry for the Because we run over, we kind of shift everything, uh, you know, uh, uh, so we've got about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so, uh, we have a little rover. Okay, uh, any questions? The says the good news is I get paid for each job. Any questions, please? Years ago, uh, I applied to teach in Wales, as my dad was Welsh. But I wasn't eligible because I didn't speak Welsh. Are there any plans after independence to introduce wider spread teaching of our languages, Gaelic and Scots, so that these languages are taught in every school in Scotland? Violet Kennedy Eskin of Dunn, Violet, Violet Jacob, 
would have spoken received pronunciation because of the background they came from. That didn't stop them writing brilliant Scots, and I'm sure communicating in brilliant Scots with the people that surround them <coughs> in, their, in, their, in their estates or where they came from. So we can't, as, a, as a, an inclusive national movement, laugh at people because they speak uh, receive pronunciation. That has to be an inclusive thing too, just to make that point. Did, did you know Chris Lee? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and his speech, in normal speech, was not quite received on it, but it's quite posh. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask yeah. yeah. There is uh, an anomaly at the moment in the, the Gaelic Ang uh, Language Act was passed in 2005 by Hollywood. There is a language minister uh, within the culture the uh, cabinet secretary's portfolio at Hollywood. They have the power to introduce a Scots language act. They have refused to do so. The Council of Europe has repeatedly criticised British and Scottish governments for not teaching the Scots language to Scots parents in the school. Scots, like any indigenous language, is a people's human right. It's their right to their language. That right is being deprived. So what the Scots government needs to do is to introduce a Scots language and to deliver the same mechanism, just similar as the Gaelic Language Act. That's the Gaelic Language Board, uh, Gaelic Language Teaching in Schools up to higher level, Gaelic Language Degrees, Gaelic Language TV Station, and that from the Scots language. That, for equality, is what they need to do. They refuse to do that. Going back to the colonial theory, it's, this is known as mystifying the tribal groups, if you like. It's favouring one elite over another. Uh, and if you look at, to some extent, the Gaelic elite in Scotland it lives in quite a prominent position, has been able to develop uh, its, its lobbying for that Gaelic language act, whereas the Scots language doesn't have that elite push, that lobby group. It doesn't have the same political power. Uh, so we have this imbalance, this inequality is institutionalized within the society. Uh, it's a bit of a divide and rule thing, but it's perfectly possible to deliver a Scots Language Act today. It should have been possible as soon as the SNP got in, had they realized the importance of Scots language, as well as Gaelic, to the Scots national consciousness and identity, and to give equality. So this could have all been delivered. Uh, uh, it could be costed out as well because we know that the Gaelic Language Act has £50 million spent approximately a year of public money, and that's for 50,000 speakers at the moment. If you assess that in the context of 1.6 million Scots speakers, which there was the last census of people who believed they spoke Scots, it's probably a lot more because a lot of Scots folk didn't speak, think they speak a language, they think they speak, uh, you know. It's the gut of English. They're tell that. They're tell to speak an inferior language, uh, which is not true. So there probably is more than two million Scots speakers. And if you factor that into the cost, it probably requires about a billion pounds of spend to teach the Scots language properly, to give it authority, and to give it authority also to make us more like the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries, if we wanted a job in Norway or Iceland or Sweden, you normally would need to speak the indigenous language to, to take up certainly a public sector job as well as maybe English. And this should and this is a condition also in some jobs in the Gaelic community, you have to be able to speak Gaelic. And that's that's a right condition uh, for that. So it, we should actually in, in, in nor, any normal independent country, the indigenous language is a condition for jobs, for employment in certain areas, particularly in the public domain and particularly at higher levels. And this would change, this would transform and provide more opportunities for Scots and provide a more basis for equality. <laughs>
It's the language, it's the landscape, it's the sea, it's the sky, it's the person's lived experience of being within community. And that community was, was, was in the air park, it's a very gallant, it's a very good word. The, the do is, is hospitality, it's having a fire in the air, it's bringing people in for a cup of tea, it's that daily combination of interaction between the human and another human, between you and the cows, between you and the milk, between you and the trees. This is the word that's dying in Scotland. The hospitality is dying, the, the, the herd is, there's no longer any burning on the heart. The, the concept of the, the claim of right and the common good of Scotland all flow from the Buddhists. And that's an understanding we've lost. And if you want to get a cultural identity back, you have to understand what happened before and bring it into the present. And so I think it's essential for if people can have a good thing about what it is in terms of what we've lost in the Gaelic, but what we've lost in terms of the relationship between us and the environment and the land and everybody that lives upon it. So I'm going to can I ask you to look into the Lucas in terms of uh, where we are in the Gaelic of Scotland. Just uh, the, I was a member of the cross-party group in the parliament 
uh, which has been revived the past few months after it's been suspended since the 2014 referendum. Uh, we tried our hardest to get the corporate body, I think it's called the people in the parliament, to have Scottish Scots signage within the parliament. It didn't get anything. Uh, and I pointed out in my speech that Scots exists on the wall outside the parliament yeah. with poems like McDermott and Lionel Jacob. And what I said in the speech was it's time to wrap these words outside the parliament and bring them into this job. Or it can be a daily, day, a daily thing of folk speaking in Scots. And again, it's the most natural thing in the world to see Cole Carney swoon. And folk would respond to it. Yeah. But, again, it uh, only happened in independence, I think, unfortunately. Ironically, in Old English, how they would say, so down was so doom. Is that right? Yeah, in Old English it was doom and broom. These were mutations. In fact, the dropped R only came in the 1790s. So, the way people, English people speak now, is cynicisms that were devised in the 18th and 19th centuries. And the main purpose of it was actually to make them unique, special, elite. So these were signs of elitism. They brought into their language and formalized. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, give them a round of applause.